John, you spoke to Adam Silver about the future of sports media, and he understands a lot of it. You have to meet them where they are, and they live on their phones. And we're going to talk the NBA, we're going to talk new media, we're going to talk a ton of other stuff today. And we're back. The Marshan Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. John, before we get started with who's up, who's down, some big news for the pod. We, we need some celebration noise here, Chris Mason. Let's go. We are the, the sports pod group named us the best business podcast. So that's the story. Look, that's a very great honor. Um, we're very appreciative of everyone who voted. Um, and it means a lot. You know, we've said this uh, in all sincerity to uh, AC Wyatt, Chris Mason, who are the blood and guts of this whole operation. Uh, I know you mentioned in your, in your uh, newsletter, Abe Madcor. I mentioned our executive sports editor at the New York Post, uh, Chris Shaw. So those are all we want to thank everybody first off. But what people really need to know is we've won this award. <laughs> and guess where John is? He's gone Hollywood. He's straight to L.A. with John. I think he thinks he's going to get an Academy Award next. He's in L.A. right now as we do the pod. Why is that, John? Well, you know, the sports pod group, you know, Peter Murray, he's a former Facebook executive. He's on the board. It's a real thing. It's gone, it's gone to my head. I'm here in Los Angeles. I'm at the CAA World Congress of Sports uh, put together by SBJ. I, inter- I just came off of interviewing Adam Silver. We have Rob Manfred that's coming on uh, on stage. He's going to be interviewed as well. Steve Phelps. We have like team owners, Steve, like Steve Ballmer, uh, Peter Seidler of the uh, of the Padres. I'm particularly excited, Andrew. We have I, I'm going to moderate a panel of big gets, a media panel with the presidents of NBC, Rick Cordella, ESPN, Burke Magnus, and Fox, Mark Silverman, along with Aviv Arman of uh, WSC Sports. So it's a it's a big event. It's like the end of COVID. It's it's packed. We have. You know, more than a thousand people rushing around here, so it's, it's it's a pretty good time. And if you want to talk to John Orand, you know this why when people listen, some people this will those will already be over. But now you need to go through somebody to talk to John Orand. You should have saw him trying to get to get ready for the podcast before he had a <laughs> bunch of people working on his mic, and I don't know. They need all kinds of things. All right, let's get no to it. No makeup though. No makeup. No makeup. All right, uh, let's get to it. Who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, Andrew, let me start off. My who's up is John Rahm, who's a PGA Tour golfer who made an appearance on CBS over over the weekend. And let me tell you, we are always asked, and we always ask people, who's the next person that's playing that's going to be an on-air star, and it's going to be Rahm. Uh, Let's listen to him talking about Patrick Cantlay as he's getting ready to do a chip shot. Listen, this is not my full-time job, obviously, but Cantley is here in a tough situation. You have a tough, a tight lie, decently flat, but where the ball is is most likely, right, his heel is going to be exposed to the ground. Um, toe probably going to be off the ground. He's got to hit it high and soft over that slope. Very tough to do. He has incredible, incredible control of the low point of the shot. He can use the bounce really, really well. That sounds easy. That's not particularly easy for somebody that, that hasn't done this before. I'm telling you, he has a future on TV doing golf if he wants to do it. Hey John, my who's up? Eduardo Perez of ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Why? The mic up segments uh, have been really good on Sunday night. I wrote about it in my newsletter. Uh, the Players Association and Major League Baseball, they got together uh, when they tr- first started doing this, and they made the president. They pay uh, the players who do the in-game uh interviews with the booths, uh, $10,000 uh, for every appearance. But behind the scenes, Eduardo Perez has been really instrumental in getting players on board and getting them to do it. And this week, they had Astros catcher Martin Maldonado, um, and it was excellent. This starts off in Spanish. You hear Perez translate, then Carl Ravage has a nice line at the end uh, here. Uh, let's listen to this clip. Amen, igual, papá. También. <laughs> he said he doesn't even want to look at me. He wasn't talking to him. <laughs> hey. Drop ball to third. Brickman on two hops. Fires to first. 
That's really nice about Fumber. That's a good thing. You know, Fumber early out. Early out with that sinker. Well, if we get three pitches, we're going to have you do this again next inning. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Another sinker right here. And so what, what I like about these is that these national games, you know, one thing that I've always kind of ESPN did too much of, and, you know, they kind of backed off a little bit of that, is to try to make it different than every other game uh, with in terms of how they approached it, talking globally instead of about the game at hand, you know, kind of de-emphasizing the fan who's watching is probably mostly interested in the teams involved. Um, they should do that as the broadcast. But if you can make these national games feel a little bit different than your average a game on regional sports networks, you should. And these mic'd up segments do it. Um, and you know, in, you can't see it on the podcast, but they had an over the um, shoulder camera angle uh, in terms of where the pitches were coming from with Maldonado, first catcher to do a mic'd up segment. So that was really good. Uh, and I, I give credit to MLB and the Player Association to get the players involved. Yes, they're paying them. Maybe not the greatest precedent, but yes, they're paying them. But I still think that was innovative and smart. And I, I think it adds something uh, to Sunday night and makes it a little bit different, which is what you're trying to do. And it's kind of hard in a long regular season, especially when you look at these series, the exact same game was played you know, two times before Sunday Night Baseball gets his chance on uh, to end the baseball week. Andrew, my who's down is Ted Sarandos of Netflix, and it's because for years, everybody's been begging for Netflix to get involved with live sports. Uh, you know, they, they've been dabbling with it. They have an F1 series called Drive to Survive. They have a golf series called Full Swing. They have a tennis series called Breakpoint. Netflix was actually negotiating with the F1 for a while before uh, before ESPN got it. But there was a, are you, a, do you watch Love is Blind, Andrew? I don't. I was all over secession on HBO on Sunday, but I am aware of what happened with Love is Blind. Well, they had a live reunion of Love is Blind and people were getting ready to watch it and they could not, uh, they, they could not do it. It, it. it was not available. People had their Sundays ruined because they need, wanted to see Netflix do a live program. And it just showed that live programming is tough. And the, the idea of Netflix getting into live sports after that, the idea of a, of a sports league or conference deciding that they want to get into bed with Netflix after that, it, it was just not a good look for them. All right, my who's down is Apple. And it's basically the same reason you had for Netflix on Saturday night. MLS, we've talked about it a lot. All the MLS games are on Apple TV and Apple TV Plus. Saturday night, Apple products went out. It was about, uh, I think, an hour delay uh, where um, you couldn't watch the games uh, if on your Apple, your, your phone, your TV, et cetera. And you just can't have that. And really, what I was going to do, I was going to do my hooves up, is Amazon. Because I think this, if you look back, like my first, I wrote a huge story, went down to Houston, spent a lot of time with Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreit and Fred Gudeli and company um, down with Amazon. Uh, and, you know, what I wrote about was Jay Marine, Marie Donahue, the heads of Amazon Sports um, and, you know, Prime Video Sports. Uh, and, you know, the fact is they had to keep it on. They had to keep Thursday Night Football on the air. And if th what happened on Saturday with, uh, Apple or what happened on Sunday with Netflix happened on Thursday night football. I, I it would have been such a disaster. I mean, the Apple thing kind of, I don't even, I don't know if everyone, everyone even heard about that one, but Netflix was a little bit of a bigger deal. Uh, but if it happened with football, so that's a credit to Amazon when they go into the negotiations, look, I don't think I don't buy, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but I don't buy like, well, now I don't think Netflix is really getting into live sports, quite honestly, at least that heavily um, at the moment. But I don't buy that this is a reason they won't. Like they, they'll figure out the technology. However, you do want proof of execution uh, with Amazon has, and now Apple will strike against them, uh, strike against Netflix. Uh, so uh, that, that's something that has been a big issue in terms of streaming uh, and in terms of how it's going to work. Yeah, let's bring that back as a topic because there are a couple things I want to add to that. Our topic one, I want to uh, really focus on, on the interview that uh, – I just did with Adam Silver on stage where, you know, he talked about the idea of going to the streamers and he, he talked about the uh, average age of a traditional TV viewer is, is old and it's getting older. And I think his quote was, 
Like, let's just try to find the people where they are. It's a wake up call, I think, for everybody in our industry and everybody here that you got to pay attention to your customers, to your fans. And they're speaking loud and clearly here. So again, exciting, incredible opportunity, not just to reach them, but to do it in what used to be unimaginable ways in terms of personalization, customization, so many new fascinating ways to engage fans. And that means not just going to streaming, like going to Amazon or Apple, but it also means trying to do more deals and interesting deals with like an Instagram or Snapchat or, you know, what, what are the social media platforms that, that younger people are on? Looking at what happened with Netflix and with Apple o over the weekend, where they weren't able to do live programming in a way that you expect from trad traditional TV is just something that even after Thursday Night Football should give some people a little bit of pause. Well, I think the issue also is that younger people aren't necessarily watching the games, right? They're interested in the NBA, but where the most money has come from for these sports leagues has been the games and watching them selling the, the games. Uh, and so... Yes, you could do a deal with Instagram, but is that going to be anything near what you get from an ESPN or WBD Sports? Uh, and so I think that's the question. What I also found of interest, uh, and then we wrote about this, I had this in my newsletter a couple of weeks ago, and then we talked about it on the pod, in terms of what that next deal is going to look like. Uh, Adam Silver mentioned broadcast. But I think then as we approach our new national deals, there may be a solution for local rights. It, probably most likely it'll be some sort of hybrid where you're going to continue to have called now traditional cable and satellite distribution. You'll probably see something you've talked about more over the air distribution and sort of um, almost a return to the past in a way where we were in the old days, more national use of broadcast, more local use of broadcast. And then of course there'll be streaming on top of that because that's where the young viewers are. It's interesting that, and What's happened now from, from a distribution standpoint, you know, you have streaming services now closer to the footprint of broadcast television. You know, broadcast, I don't know, 100, you know these numbers, 130 million homes, you know, stream, you know, streaming is probably 115 million homes. And you have roughly, putting aside age now, essentially 50 million homes in this country that don't get cable or satellite now. So, a huge underserved market, but from a league standpoint, also a huge opportunity. Being more on broadcast, uh, I think we've pointed to that a lot. You know, ABC and ESPN, uh, I do believe that they're going to keep uh, the NBA, uh, but we've pointed to NBC. Now, there haven't been any discussions yet, but NBC is definitely interested if it's the right price. Uh, I don't think you can totally, you know, count out just at the moment Fox or CBS, even though I think they're less likely. Uh, than NBC in, in my estimation. And then you'll have a digital player, Amazon and Apple, maybe a YouTube TV. Uh, you've already thrown Netflix now out of the equation. Um, and so when you look at it, uh, we, the game plan's there. And I think we, really the NFL, what they did is sort of the blueprint, uh, if you ask me. Great points, Andrew. That was like, it's like back to the future as it pertains to broadcast television. But one thing that I also found to be interesting is like, I asked him about the RSN business and this fall, how are we going to watch NBA games in our local markets this fall? And what I found interesting is that he didn't really have a great answer for it. He's like, he, he said what he hoped. He hoped that they would still do deals with Diamond Sports and, and, uh, and, and uh, the Valley Sports Networks would continue to carry the games. But that's still somewhat up in the air. And they're just trying to get to something that's like two years down the road when the national deal starts to, to, to come in and, and they start to negotiate that out. There's no doubt that, I'll just say politely, that we need to reimagine these relationships um, that, you know, there's, there's the, the specific issue in terms of diamond to the enormous their debt that they had in correcting that issue. But then in terms of the fundamentals of the business, um, Everybody sees what's happening in the television market, that you've had a dramatic decline in the number of cable homes. And, and particularly for us, it's not just the decline, because when you include the virtual distributors, it's not as low as I think a lot of people think. There's still 75 million homes receiving cable satellite you know, programming in the United States. 
but it has a particular impact on a sport like ours that has a very young viewership. I mean, I, the numbers, and the numbers are dramatic in terms of that fall off a, a, of, of our young fans, um, whether or not they actually are subscribing to cable, because often that's just a broadband provider, they're not watching traditional television the way an older generation was. And so, and, and it's why Sinclair, now Diamond, was so focused on taking those same games and distributing them digitally, not just from a linear standpoint. And so that's something, as, as they're trying to reimagine their business, part of it is to be, have, have a digi digital package to go alongside the linear package. Those 75 million homes, even if they continue to drop down, are still gonna be important for the, certainly the, the midterm future. All right, before we move to the next topic, John, I thought it was real interesting was what he said about the in-season tournament and how the media rights are gonna work. Yeah, that was the most that I've heard him talk about the in-season tournament to date. And he talked about uh, the tournament is going to be within the regular season. There, So there's still going to be regular season games that are going to count for these teams going to the playoffs. But the teams are going to probably play in different uniforms. They're probably going to play on a different court. And it's going to start most likely this fall. It's going to be, the, it's going to be in November, December. And he's really patterning it after like the FA Cup in England or some of these soccer uh, soccer matches. And in fact, he said it's the growing internal internationalization of the NBA that really helped push this through because the international players they totally under, understand that you know you have a trophy, the, the Larry O'Brien Trophy for winning the championship, but you also have another trophy for winning you know an, an in-season tournament, which which happens in. You know, most soccer leagues over in Europe. So the international players bought into that uh, much, much quicker than the American players. This will all take place um, in November and December of the season. And we initially, in discussions with the Players Association, our teams had talked about a, s several additional games on top of our schedule. We ultimately agreed that given um, the wear and tear already on our players over a, a significant long season that the ultimately the two teams competing in the championship game would be in their 83rd game of the season essentially we'd be adding only one game at the end and then you know and, and it's, it gets complicated in terms of how we figure out how teams will will who aren't in that last round will then play each other so that we'll still work out with every other team playing 82 games but as I said I, I think that fans will be intrigued by this and I think that Particularly, it was interesting when we first started talking to our players about it several years ago, part of the initial reaction from players was, why would we care? It's interesting, with, with getting close to a third of our players now who were born outside the United States, they're very familiar with this cup notion from European soccer or soccer tournaments elsewhere in the world. So I think they adapted to it very quickly. And I think, frankly, our American players have come along. Many c colleges, you know, aside from the NCAA tournament, they have a holiday tournament or other things like that. The concept isn't that different. But um, as I said, I, you know, we're, there's work to do in sort of finalizing exactly how this is going to be presented to the fans. But, but as I said, I, I'm excited, and, and it, it is a significant, significant new provision. Um, in our relationship with the players. What's your goal? Uh, this this uh, fall seems too quick for it. The, the following fall? No, it's, it's, it's coming this fall. this fall. I mean, we're moving quickly, yeah. Uh, it's part of the 82-game regular season scheduled uh, media rights. Are you, able to, are you going to be able to sell this uniquely to somebody? We won't this year. I mean, I think the idea is rather than going out and, and First of all, we're, we're, we'd be limited to our existing partners anyway, but I think in fairness to them, I think with it's all that's going on in the media market to go to them and say, pay us incrementally, we, you know, we've unilaterally decided we're doing this, didn't seem appropriate. I think what made more sense is to say to them, let's work together, let's launch this. You know, I believe it will create new value, and as you've talked about and written about many times, then we'll be out in the marketplace two seasons from now, and then we'll see. But I, I, I think it, just as the play-in has had significant value, I think this, this cup tournament will as well. One other area that I found to be really uh, interesting is that he expects it to start this coming fall. And he says that ESPN and Turner are gonna be carrying those games just as a part of their regular contracts. 
And he didn't actually say this, but he alluded to the idea that in two years, when they start to negotiate those rights, he's going to be able to pull out this tournament and these games from this tournament. And that's going to be something that will, um, I'm pretty certain it's going to uh, command a top penny uh, from somebody like Amazon that, that has a, a, you know, when they do the deal for the Premier League over in, in London, it's for the Boxing Day games, the day after Christmas. Like they, 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 they like to theme something like that. And having a theme to where it's not necessarily a night of the week, but like we're going to have all of the, uh, the in-season tournament games is something that I think would attract somebody like Amazon. Yeah, well, these places are usually pretty smart. They think about this stuff a lot. I don't think it's a coincidence. It's, this is going to start the year before their next contracts up. Uh, I don't think that just happened. Um, I think that was very, that's smart, of course, by them uh, to do that. And I'm all in favor of it. We talked about it. You talked to them about baseball um, as well. And I'm all in favor of this in-season tournament because we've talked about it before. Uh, yeah, the ratings so far in the playoffs as we speak, the first weekend were really good. Up, uh, I think overall it's best since like 2011. And then, uh, you know, each of the networks, they're touting better ratings, um, which all seem to be accurate. Uh, and so the uh so that's a positive for them but the in se- the regular season they got to work on and this might give it some oomph so you got to try some things i think the example you used with wbc is a good example because you know people can laugh at the wbc say it's not a real tournament well there's real interest you know you could you look at the stadium there's real interest and there's late la- late games uh i think a lot of us who like baseball were watching those games they weren't you know they weren't just uh forget about it you you want to tune in for those and i just think that's only going to grow so i think that's a positive. And how about this world where people are looking to baseball for innovation? You are, by the way, a big baseball fan. Did you like the WBC? I love it. Yeah, I wasn't tuning in to all the early rounds. And I will tell you that that's the thing. Like everyone wants, like the NBA does this new tournament. Everyone wants it to be like at the same level as the finals. I think what Silver said, those things grow, number one, to get to that level. Uh, number two, if you look at the FA Cup, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the championship, the final is great. Um, and in the earlier rounds, some of the teams don't necessarily, they're, it, the way it works, it's the whole country. So lower level teams, and the equivalent would be like in baseball, if like minor league teams could play against major league teams. And sometimes they upset them, um, not regularly. But they don't always play their best players or all their best players because they have other games that week. Um, and so, but when they get to the final, then they usually play their best players. And so there's more interest in the semifinal and the finals. And I think you could see a similar thing happen with the NBA, uh, especially early on, is that these early tournament games, yeah, there'll be some interest. But as it goes on and you get to a championship game and it's a one-game championship and they can put some value so the players really care about it, uh, then I think that's where the interest will continue to grow. Um, And I also think there'd be something, if I were them, and again, I know they, they've been thinking about this 24-7, something that I would consider, and I've said it before in the podcast, I would have it somehow tied into the regular season, the previous regular season, which is how soccer works internationally. I just think that will add something to um, regular season importance to qualify into this tournament. That would that, be my opinion. All right, Andrew, let's move to uh, topic two, uh, the coming layoffs at ESPN. Tell me what you're hearing. Well, I think they're happening relatively soon. I think there's going to be three rounds, from what I understand. Uh, The first round is probably going to be less talent, more, um, you know, normal people and executives, um, potentially. Uh, You know, we're we're speaking now, uh, going to the podcast. I don't know exactly. You know, I've heard different things about when they'll first come in, but then I think there'll be two other rounds um, of layoffs. Um, And so... You know, we talked about this before. ESPN's, you know, making choices. I, I wrote the other day um, that they just re-signed Marcus Spears to a new four-year deal, lucrative deal, a multi-million dollars um, overall uh, and per year, it's seven figures per year. So they're making choices. And then I do think they're going to go to some other people who, you know, make, you know, big numbers and say, well, you can stay, but we're going to cut you in half. And people are going to have decisions to make on that. Um, they might end up just leaving and getting paid their full contract. That's a tough decision to make, to make to have to work and make less than leaving and making your full uh, number. Where does that leave you going forward? But I think that's what we're going to see. And I think, you know, we'll have the initial round and then two other rounds. And it makes, and I, I don't really fully know why they do it this way. I think it might have something to do with the HR and, and, you know, there's some legal things when you have to do with all this stuff. 
that just makes for it's, it's a black cloud right now over Bristol um, that is it makes it very difficult for everybody. Yeah, I don't understand the three rounds. I, 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 I people at ESPN, people up in Bristol, they've known this is coming for you know for a month. I mean, the the morale on campus um, uh, is, I don't know if it's good or bad. I, I know that it, people are on edge because the message that's coming down is nobody's safe. And we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to be sort of, uh, ESPN is going to be looking at all areas in order to, to make these cuts moving forward. And, you know, I know you brought up uh, the Marcus Spears contract. You broke that story. He's getting a, a big contract and seeing uh, ESPN pay for an on-air talent like that as they're going and, and making these cuts is something that I know a lot of the public doesn't understand. But, you know, we talk about it with rights as well. Need to have, must have. They've identified Marcus Spears as like as somebody that, that is that they need to have on air. And it doesn't, you know, people, I know a lot of people trying to make a uh, connection between the two. And there was really no connection. The ESPN is still going to be bidding very heavily on the NBA. ESPN is still going to be very bidding very heavily on the college football playoff, even though it has to cut costs and shed uh, uh, some of its workforce. Yeah, these are corporate layoffs. Bob Iger announced in February that Disney overall was going to let go 7,000 uh, employees. And so that's going to impact ESPN because it's going to impact every part of the Disney company. Uh, and so ESPN is going to be involved in that. It is difficult, though. ESPN, to me, is still the Yankees of sports media. I know you're an Oriole fan. I mean that as a positive. The Yankees of sports media. I mean they're they're number one. They're they're the first, number one. First time the Yankees have been positive yet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can use whatever analogy you want, um, but you know they're still number one. I don't think. I think it's pretty undisputed still at this point, in my opinion. Um, you know, like in terms of TV, Fox Sports has a lot as well in terms of what they broadcast, but in terms of tonnage, in terms of importance. Uh, the amount of platforms they have. I, it's hard to argue against the ESPN, I think, at this point. That said, and that's why these are kind of frustrating to me. I mean, you know, having worked there and been there during layoffs, I mean, the one thing I don't really understand corporate-wise is, let's just say they save $30 million. Like, I don't know what that does. I guess it aggregates over time, you know, but they're going to hire people back. It just feels like kind of a, ruining some people's lives as an exercise to help your your uh, stock price, which is disheartening, uh, because I mean they make I, if you do the math about seven hundred and seventy five million dollars per month in cable um, fees uh, that they bring in. That's before they sell an ad. Uh, that's a lot of money. So you take thirty million off. Does that really have an impact? That, that said, um, I don't want to sound heartless here. It's not like you can't have attrition in a company. They don't have to employ everybody forever. Everyone doesn't get a lifetime contract. I'm very aware of that. It just, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't know what kind of impact this is making, especially when you're going to be adding salary in, you know, it's so that, that's where I find it. Um, it's a, it's, it's odd, but we've seen this all over corporate America and, you know, the economy is apparently, you know, going the wrong direction. Yeah. It's not unique to Disney. I want to go to the, the next topic, Andrew. We, we both talked about this in our who's down uh, Netflix and Apple. And there are two, two added points I want to make here. And what, one is, I think one of the reasons that we focus on Netflix and Apple in the beginning of this pod is because their communication to their viewers in, in both instances was abysmal. I mean, the, the, I, I think Netflix put out a tweet and, uh, and, and then didn't update that tweet for hours. Apple, I have, I have people, I saw that you did too, on social media that were reaching out saying, do I know what's going on? I, they weren't communicating what the problem was. And that is, that's lesson number one. I mean, that's, so I think that's one of the reasons why there's a pile on. And the second reason is that uh, there's, a, there's a pile on just because, frankly, it's kind of fun to have a pile on, I think. These are issues that both these companies are going to address and move forward, and it's, it's not going to be a big problem, uh, ultimately. Uh, but if this had happened to Amazon with Thursday Night Football, we would have jumped all over them. If this happened with ESPN for a Conference USA game, then we've jumped all over them as well. And so, you know, it, it happened. There were technical problems. They didn't uh, communicate the, the problems well. And so, we're you know, th this is our chance to sort of jump all over them. For, uh, from that aspect as well.
Well, here's my thing for tech companies, and I know they're all smarter than than me and smarter than everyone who works in sports media, and they're smarter than everybody. So um, they, they can they can take this advice that they want. Sports is different. Live is different. And the products that they've created, all the credit in the world to them for creating Netflix, uh, for all the Apple products, they've changed the world. Um, that said, and now I'm going to talk sports specifically, sports is a tell me right now thing. Uh, and so if you're out when the MLS is out, you need to answer that question. You need to be transparent and you need to be fast with it. And even the media companies who understand that sometimes take are too slow on, on certain issues. Uh, and just the way it works is different. And I just think that some of these tech companies, um, it's, you know, not all of them, when they hire people, um, you know, who aren't only tech people, but the tech people part of it, they think they can just because it's so easy for them in other aspects of their businesses, because they own the product, right? If you're Amazon, you own distribution better than anybody. Again, they've earned that right, just as ESPN earned the right with distribution back in the day to be the leaders in sports media. Uh, the Apple with their products, you know, they own that. So, but they don't own the product in sports, right? Even if you do get one of these products, you don't own the product. And so it's a different you're working at a different um, leverage point than you are. And I don't think they fully understand that. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, for some, I don't know, I could see them kind of uh, maybe not even being long-term into sports just because it's just, it's different and they just can't come in and dominate it. It's going to take years and years. Like even if you talk about Apple, as much money as they have, it, the idea of Apple taking over sports is a long way off. If I was a sports league or a sports conference, that would fill me with fear, man. We talked about this. I wrote about this in my first newsletter. This is about a year and a half ago. I mean, ESPN went on a $40 billion uh, rights uh, shopping spree, and that was designed to, to further their company, but also to block all these digital players out. So hopefully for, for ESPN's purposes, they get disinterested. And I, I just think you look at Apple, they're not going to be in the NFL game the only chance they have is seven years from now if they reopen to be in the 2020s. Uh, I guess we'd be at the end of the 2020s. If they reopen the contracts with the NFL has the right to do. If not, they're looking at 2033 before they can get into, you know, by that time, this podcast might have an Academy Award. <laughs> How many awards will this podcast have by then? What are the chances we're doing it at that point? Anyways, oh. the, uh, <laughs> but the point is, I don't know. They, 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 they kind of have to, I think they just have to treat it differently if they want to be in it. Amazon, I feel like has had the best strategy so far and they've pulled off the stuff very well so far uh, from the deals they've made uh, and the execution they've had with what they've done to make that product something that sports fans actually like. Uh, and so... Uh, thus far, to me, they're by far in the lead. A constant theme of the pod, Andrew, it's a relationship business, and the tech companies aren't used to having to do these types of relationships and, and carry these relation, relationships over. And that's been uh, a learning curve for the leagues, and that's been a learning curve for the, the tech, tech industry as well. All right, John, let's just do a couple more quick topics uh, before we wrap it up. Uh, MLB Innovation. Uh, Adam Silver had interesting comments to you about what baseball has done. You know, for years, people in baseball would always complain that they couldn't change anything about the game. But you look at the NBA and they, they change your, the, the way teams can play defense or they change the way people take charges around the basket. And it's it's always seemed to be much easier for the NBA to do it than MLB. Than MLB. Well, as we all know, MLB uh, has a pitch clock. They have uh, bigger bases. They banned the shift. Uh, and so that was something that I asked Adam Silver on stage about. Uh, generally, commissioners do not like to talk about other sports, but I thought uh, Silver's answer was uh, somewhat interesting. Let's listen to that. Hats off to them and to Rob Manfred. I, I know it's interesting, you know, I, that it's always, and I know in our game, a challenge, particularly for, I'll just say, for commissioners who didn't play the game, to have the credibility to push through with your baseball people, your basketball people, your football people, those changes that you think are necessary, um, that is, as some of those panelists were saying, that when your fans are telling you what they're interested in, the fans are saying the pace isn't right, the fans are saying the games are too long, and then generally you find, um, not just in 
the managers and the GMs, but even the young players tend to be more traditionalist. Like I, it, 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 there's a reason why even the play-in tournament took us several years because initially the players, and putting aside even you know the, the players' association as their representatives, the players themselves were saying, "Well, this isn't right. We play a long, long regular season. If you're not one of the top eight seeds, you shouldn't be in the playoffs." And that's how they'd grown up, and that's how they saw it. I think what you can take away from Adam Silver's answer is that everything is up for grabs. I, there, there is because, because baseball was able to do this because the uh, response has been generally very fa favorable for baseball doing this. You know, what's to stop the, the, the NBA or the NHL or even the NFL from making changes uh, almost on the fly? Well, I think the NFL has really been ahead of the game on that one. I mean, they've been like, it annoys me as someone who's was growing up a huge Dan Marino fan. I mean, the, the rules have changed. Like, you know, when they compare quarterbacks from the past to quarterbacks today, it's ridiculous. I mean, if Dan Marino, if Bruce Smith wasn't allowed to hit Dan Marino, uh, I'd like to see what happened in those Bills-Dolphins game. Let's replay those uh, with, you know, <laughs> Bruce Smith, like, breathed on him 15 yards. So the NFL has done a lot, to, especially with the, to increase the offense. I think the, you know, people have talked a lot about the blocking rule because of the injuries that happened uh, with Giannis and then um, with John Morant. Uh, and when you look at it, yeah, I don't know if I changed that. The one thing I do think, though, is someone, I love the three-pointer, but I think some of these games have too many three-pointers. And is there a way to change it so it encourages going inside more? Um, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, I think if I'm the NBA, I'd look at, again, you want to see Steph Curry, you know, jacking up threes from everywhere. It's just when the whole game becomes about the three-pointer, and I get it, it's more efficient. I mean, that's what happened in baseball with Theo Epstein's and Billy Beans of the world, et cetera, Tampa Bay, what they've done down there. You know, they figured out, you know, the math and, you know, better ways to play, but it to be less interesting, I think, to a lesser degree, but also at the NBA, they have to look at that and say, um, how do we kind of make it so, you know, we encourage, you know, other shots besides three-pointers? What I find interesting too, Andrew, I just did a, a quick story in my newsletter that comes out on Mondays. Yeah, it's too too early to make any kind of pronouncements. I mean, the baseball season is only two and a half uh, weeks old, but the early signs are showing that people are watching longer, even though the games are shorter. Uh, ESPN said that typically, with these long games that they used to have in the fourth or fifth inning. You know, they would see somewhat of a drop off in viewers. So far, through spring training in the first couple of weeks, they haven't seen that drop off at all, and they're very, very encouraged about that moving forward. Look, I don't like the samples of one or your kid told you something. So I didn't. But I'll just tell you on a personal level, my gut is that I'm just more into watching these games this year because I just know I can get to the end. I know that it's not necessarily going to be my whole afternoon on a Saturday. It's not necessarily going to be my whole evening on a Wednesday. And yeah, of course, you know, previous years I'm in and out, but to actually just sit and watch only the game, you know, flip during commercials, do whatever. But like, I just, if you're telling me I'm going to get out of there 9, 30, 10 o'clock and 10 o'clock would be late. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm more interested in that and selling the game long-term. I would, I said this about a million times. When I covered baseball, how bad is it that the most exciting time of the game, the ninth inning, you would look at Yankee Stadium or City Field or you know Camden Yards, and there's nobody there. This is the this is when you're selling your game, the biggest moments of the game, and no one's there. You know, so many people have left already. The traffic, it's cold, school night, etc. You know, work early. Instead, and I know people have complained about you know, or there's been talk about. Well, they're going to sell less beer. Get there a little bit earlier if you can. I mean, obviously that, that could be a problem. You know, getting at seven o'clock is not easy for everybody. But um, you know, that's one of the things. I, I think it's a hundred. It's just such a win, a long-term win. I don't even care if the ratings aren't better this year, which I they are to start out and they might be. I think long-term, it's just it's a better. You have to just focus on. You can do all the studies you want. Your gut, you have to know is this good or not. It's a better product. And the NBA has to ask themselves about a better product. One red flag on the, on the shorter games, though, Andrew. Keep your eye on the fall. What happens during the World Series? Is Fox going to be happy with a two-hour, one-nothing game at, when, when they have a four-hour window that they're trying to fill? Uh, 
I, I, that's just something that I know the networks are gonna uh, pop, are gonna push back on having these rules be so strict as as the uh, the games get more important. But I gotta be honest with you. I mean, maybe you want to add five seconds to the pitch clock, you know, for these games. Fine. I don't know. When, when I've been watching games that are two and a half, three hours all year, don't tell me that now I gotta watch a four hour game because you want to throw in a couple more commercials. You know what Adam Silver said? He was like, don't focus on the time or the length. It's all about the pacing. And the whole yes. pacing is good. And so if it was four hours, but they're staying in the batter's box and they're hitting and running, and that's one thing. But if it's four hours of the pitcher walking around the mound or the batter getting out of the box and adjusting the box and adjusting his gloves, yeah, that's death. And I, I heard, was he on the Michael K show in New York? I, um, Rob Manfred was on uh, someplace where he said that it hasn't, he hasn't really thought about that. So I don't know if that's in play. I think it's better for Fox long term if these World Series games go three hours. I really do. I think long term, again, you, it's not a national. It's a re, it's a national sport that's regional. So the the idea of comparing the World Series in the game seven to Super Bowl is stupid. Um, but you know, if you want to get more viewers, if, again, if you're going to tell me it's a three hour commitment, maybe three and a half for the World Series five, it just can't be like an un, unlimited commitment like where i i, I gotta tell you you're gonna tell me i gotta bed at midnight you know just to watch this game especially if i'm not as interested in it it just the, the tide's gonna go to the pillow okay that's what i'm going i want to sleep if, if that's the case it, as opposed to if you're gonna tell me i'm gonna be able to see the most important aspects of the game at a reasonable time i think that's better for fox long term all right john that's gonna do it for this week i uh, want to thank ac Wyatt and chris mason for putting it all together uh, the award-winning win. ac wyatt and chris mason yeah you see that's the thing about john Holly, we call him hollywood john Orrin. now <laughs> people don't know he's got he's gonna do a couple more symposiums or whatever they, they got they have like uh catering ready for him mr Orrin, can you do this <laughs> this is what he's doing at, i don't ever come back from hollywood he'll be a la dodger fan uh, by the time we get back and we do not want to hear anything about the orioles okay o only after they sign adley rushman I will tell you, nobody, I get, I'm getting tweets and texts. No more Orioles from Orient. All right. That's, what <laughs> are, that's the biggest thing. We, you might think we're award winning. We're going to be award losing pretty soon with the uh, Oriole talk. Uh, people don't want it. They don't want that. Okay. I'm like kidding. They, they love it. All right. So ACY, Chris Mason, uh, they make it all happen. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. Stars and reviews is very appreciated. Uh, so John, fly back safely if you come back. See you next week. And thank you for listening.